Hello, everyone. This is John Reed. Uh, I just got through taping a very interesting program, which you're about to listen to, an informal discussion with Clive and Greg, uh, two frequent Digitonomica commenters and blockchain enthusiasts and advocates uh, to share an enterprise view on the blockchain and what it means to them and why they're so passionate about it. It was a good discussion. You're going to hear that Greg's audio was a little bit limited. Uh, you can hear him, but it's going to take you a little bit of effort. I'll do my best in post-production to uh, boost the sound levels and improve that, but that is going to be a little bit harder to listen to than than I would like, but it's a limitation in Greg's equipment that we just had to, to work with on this one. So uh, I'm also going to be writing about this podcast, so if you find yourself wanting to not listen to the whole thing, then check digenomica.com um, and do a search on blockchain in my name and you'll find the article as well. Uh, but anyhow, I think you will enjoy the discussion if you put on some headsets or limit the noise in the background. You should be able to hear Greg okay. All right, thanks a lot. Enjoy. And we are live, audio only, but with profile pictures. <laughs> this is a special uh, pre-holiday uh, blockchain and hyperledger for the enterprise informal chat with two guys that I am really intrigued to get their views. I've got... Um, Greg and and Clive, uh, how are you doing, guys? Very good. Looking forward to the Christmas and uh, all the festivities. Doing good, doing good John. Um, enjoying the last minute shopping for the family. Yes, indeed. And for for Digonomica readers, the first thing you have to know is there's a there's a pretty cool story behind Greg and Clive. So so these guys are two of the most frequent. L- uh, posters on any of my blogs, and they usually have st- very strong opinions, which is always welcome. Um, in fact, Clive is a regular on my hits and misses, so he actually gets like a special thing in the column itself, basically over to you because I'm always waiting for his comment. But both these guys pester me constantly about the blockchain because they're super interested in in the enterprise impact, and so I really wanted to better understand uh, how each of them views blockchain and why they think it's so important. Uh, Because obviously there's a lot of hype around blockchain as well. But it gets better because on Twitter, I don't know, was it like a couple weeks ago now? uh, I'm getting these pings and these guys, both of them are at a Hyperledger hacking event in New York and they end up meeting. So my two fave commenters actually meet in person. You just can't make this kind of stuff up, guys. (laughs) Yeah, that was quite a... uh... Quite a, quite a, quite a trifactor of uh, connections there. We were actually sitting on uh, almost opposite sides of the uh, Hackfest room at WeWork in uh, New York City on Park Avenue, with about maybe I don't know. I would say perhaps close to a hundred uh, people from different organizations, uh, folks from everything from IBM, Cisco, Intel, to Chinese companies, to uh, folks from developers from the uh, Linux, Linux branch of the, um, of, of the Hyperledger, Hyperledger Foundation, and including its, uh, its director. And so, Clive, how did you figure out that Greg was there? Did you, did you, first of all, did you know who he was from like some – some of your comments and discussions on my site and stuff, and you kind of figured out he was there. Well, I'd seen I'd seen John, I'd seen Greg's name, but like many people, he has a slightly more cryptic name on 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 Twitter as sort of a nickname. And and um, I was tweeting with you, John, that I was I think I was at the Hyperledger, and then you either Greg chimed in that he was there, or you, and I think that you cemented that by saying uh i know that you guys will connect there and we did that is wicked cool uh yes i just want to say uh that i think this is the social media and it's best between uh the genomica uh, blog postings and comments to it and the twitter and i think it was slack that i just started asking questions uh one of the slack channels that were um connected to the event uh that kind of all three um, put us uh together and, and i think that's why it's one of the reasons we would have this call today. Yeah, I, to, I totally agree with you. I, many years ago, I was in, I had a free night in um, Silicon Valley somewhere, 
and someone pinged me like, oh, James Governor's in town and uh, from Red Monk. And I think I'd met him once, but maybe twice, but an hour and a half later, I'm in a, I'm in a pub with James Governor, which of course is classic. And, uh, and a, and a new Red Monk hire, Donnie Burkholz, who's since moved on for Red Monk, but unbelievably classic uh, evening that came out of like just some third party kind of putting us together on Twitter. So I, I find that stuff fascinating. Before we dig into the discussion, I just want to make sure that we don't talk kind of over our listeners' heads a little bit. So can, can you guys maybe just share a little bit about kind of how you see the blockchain and, and also a little bit about your interest in it. So like in terms of how it's defined, right? Because I'm not sure all of our listeners understand that this originated with Bitcoin and now it may have other applications. So maybe just frame that a little bit for us. This is Clive here. I think that um, blockchain technologies uh, can easily get confused with the Bitcoin uh, technologies because they're from the same branch of uh, cryptography or database technologies. But the Hyperledger uh, is quite a bit different than the um, Bitcoin technologies. Hyperledger is not a single blockchain project like um, like Ethereum or like uh, Bitcoin. It is a um, business blockchain technology based around a common ledger. And that common ledger can be used to... Um, arrive at consensus in business-related transactions um, that could be financial, that could be other types of uh, transactions that go on. Many at this point in time seem to be the finance boys um, and girls are driving this. I'd say they're more at the head of the, the head of the chain to put, throw in a bit upon there, not deliberately, but it came out in terms of driving the use cases. Um, And so that's um, just a little thumbnail sketch there. Probably Greg has got some, perhaps some some better way to look at it. For me, Hackfest was a little bit of homecoming because it took place right across from uh, where I started in the ERP world uh, with SAP technology, not for SAP as as a partner or employee. Um, so this was a little bit of homecoming right across the, the street from um, Logan Pastoria and uh, there's an office for um, Park App and from Park App for uh, KPMG. So this is uh, how I started my career in uh, ERP and I think I'm still there uh, pretty much every day. Um, the, the Hyperledger piece, um, I, th- I think I got interested with uh, Bitcoin a bit, a bit a year ago and it uh, was a little bit in- I was a little bit intrigued by the um, how much noise it was making, and I think still is, and it kind of became um, much more than uh, what was, I think, originally envisioned. To me, Hyperledger is uh, financial services, first of all, but also other traditional ERP clients, customers, answer to to Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has this um, grassroots um, origins. It, it, It tries to maintain it. At the same time, uh, there, there are wild promises that are being made, uh, what it can or cannot do. And some of it uh, kind of spills over into the blockchain as well. But uh, Hyperledger is, is trying to put some reason into um, into this um, hype at this point, the, the way I see it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's Linux Foundation. Uh, so it has um, some credibility from a development point of view. Uh, but uh, there are big contributors from uh, traditional IT companies, um, IBM being the, the main um, driver, but uh, not the only one. There's Intel. Uh, there's there's uh, quite a few upstarts um, or startups, I should say. <laughs> um, so to, to me, uh, since I've been associated with, um, with those technologies and, and I kind of practice them on a daily basis, uh, I always had an eye on, on, on blockchain and anything that happens uh, with, uh, with ledgers, technologies, accounting, auditing, permissions, you, you name it. Greg, you don't see this as a massive departure from your from your ERP roots? Because I don't think there's very many SAP financials people that are that are interested in, in blockchain or, or that even get that deep into the technology as you have. Uh, I think the way... Um, 
and I think I cannot speak for either IBM or SAP um, or, or anybody else here, <laughs> just for myself. I, I think SAP is has interest, uh, vested interest. It's an incumbent in the space uh, as far as ledgers and payments go. Um, by providing solutions to uh, financial services companies and multinationals and um, all, all the large business players. Um, I can't think of a company that doesn't have uh, SAP implementation. Uh, if you look at Dow 30 or, or internationally, um, it, it's, it's just there today. Uh, it kind of started in the late 90s, um, slowed down a little bit, um, mid 2000s. Um, now, you, John, are more familiar with the, with the marketing message than I am. I, I just don't believe SAP wouldn't do anything in this space. I mean, they made some comments. Um, I asked some questions on the on the publicly available uh, sites. Uh, usually, I get uh, either no answer or kind of vague answers, but I definitely see interest uh, from SAP um, and probably other ERP vendors. Uh, Oracle, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Oracle, Microsoft. Microsoft is definitely dedicated, but uh, I'm sure Oracle is working on it as well. Yeah, so I, I think I'd like to just give you a little bit of uh, personal background here to <clears throat> uh, tell where I'm coming from and why I'm particularly interested in blockchain technologies. So <clears throat> from a from an early architecture stage to managing products, I actually worked in, um, in Silicon Valley for about 15 years on a product called Max. It's now um, a... a a, a micro, it's now a micro ERP product uh, belongs to um, Exact Software in the Netherlands. And <clears throat> that product had a lot of strengths in traceability, particularly in electronics and uh, equipment, small equipment manufacturing, everything, anything from a modem to a medical device. And <clears throat> what I noticed is that... Um, it was such a small ERP system that it would often be chosen um, by a larger company when they were launching a new product um, that was growing so quickly. They couldn't actually, they didn't need it, uh, an SAP product at that point. They just needed something that they could get up and going with. And then they had a plan in place to replace it by SAP, but they were running too fast to actually um, and needed to be extremely nimble over a very short period of time because they're doing um, very fast engineering changes, and, and they didn't have many people. This was like extreme, extremely fast, up and running and go. Um, so so um, I'd done some consulting before then, and I got to, to actually implement in this package, in this, in this uh, what, I, what, I, what I could see the business problems were in terms of um, bills and material and traceability. And... <clears throat> And then that led into um, an, an awareness, and I was working for a company called Keywall Systems at the time, of actually connecting um, uh, SME-type systems together in hubs and spokes. And, and, of, and when those hubs and spokes grew and became large, the difficulties of doing that with um, EDI-type technologies. So um, I ended up working in more in research engineering um, and and that took me actually into working with Google technologies and I ended up working as a side project uh, a product called or a project an open source project called Camly store that has a lot of um, blockchain type technologies it isn't a blockchain at all it's a personal data store but I started um, building um, traceability systems based on this personal uh, data store. I, I did one for um, uh, for a basically a, a food a nonprofit food distribution center that was staffed by AmeriCorps folks. And <clears throat> what I learned by doing that was uh, that I needed the connectivity with blockchain not just the technologies that I almost stumbled upon. So I was trying to solve the business problem, but I had the wrong technologies. And then when I discovered blockchain, and actually I discovered Bitcoin first, I actually spent some time working um, at a um, 
inside an incubator where there was a, a Bitcoin, um, early Bitcoin um, startup. And I was very friendly with uh, everybody there. And uh, so my awareness was very high. And so when I saw blockchain, I was I just had a feeling, almost an intuition, that here was the, the set of technologies and I started learning everything that I possibly could about these technologies because I could see this as, a, as an open source project. And we haven't really had an open source project in the ERP field where people have been um, taking a use case and building um, in an open environment to try and um, develop the standards and the um, sample code and to start to scale out the technology to solve much larger larger problems. So that's that's my background and how, I, how I'm so excited about um, blockchain technologies and Hyperledger in particular. Right. So just for our listeners, there's another piece of – of thinking around the blockchain, right? Because so first of all, there's, there is a blockchain with a capital B that is, that underlies Bitcoin. What we're talking about in the enterprise is taking that underlying piece as an inspiration, a distributed ledger, if you will, for other types of projects, which is kind of how Hyperledger fits into the picture. Um, but there's other attributes of the blockchain that, that have caused a lot of, hype and attention that folks are interested in. Uh, and it has to do with its its ability to, I guess you could say, uh, uh, sort of force, force trust upon a trustless environment, <laughs> essentially, you know, supposedly sort of being able to verify everyone's uh, identity on a blockchain. So in other words, people have thought about the applicability in many industries where there might be unique assets that need to be verified. Uh, land titles, for example, are one scenario that's come up sometimes. Uh, identity management is another one that where there seems to be a lot of potentials. So maybe you guys could just speak briefly to these other aspects besides just a distributed ledger. Um, I, can, I can take that, John. Um, I think distributed ledger is, is actual uh, new... Um, moniker for uh, anything that business wants to do with blockchain. So uh, I think it's much nicer uh, than ERP. ERP has this kind of historical connotation that started uh, again late 90s uh, before we had uh, mobile phones uh, or smartphones and uh, even before uh, dot com um, in the early 2000s. Uh, having said that, um, you I cannot imagine a business without some sort of ledger, I and mean, it, it cuts across all industries. So right now, um, I see financial services, pharmaceuticals, and um, pretty much everybody uh, who needs to run a ledger to um, to use it as a, as a, as underlying IT solution, which which doesn't exist in the traditional ERP systems. Uh, and so it, it depends. Um, even so, recently there was an initiative on around the financial reporting XDRL. They also want to do blockchain, so it's financial chain, if, if you can imagine. Um, so it looks like all arrows are pointing to that. Um, so in, in, in the, the further uh, Bitcoin soars, uh, I think the more interest it generates. So but it's it's also um, a, a big question mark. Uh, what if it um, I mean, if everybody's going to just turn away from blockchain and just say, hey, this big experiment uh, never worked. Uh, so there, there's this edginess, um, I would say, between the, the, the grassroots, um, um, what has worked so far, even if it collapsed a few years back, and especially in this year, there were, there were some spectacular failures um, for blockchain, but it seems to have survived them. Uh, so I, I think we will see more than one in, in 2017. Um, but the question is, um, will it have enough of a steam that it gathered for for businesses, large businesses and small businesses like 
seems like Clypus is more on the small business side um, to, to actually make it a, a mission critical solution. So I think uh, what I can add to that is that um, that Hyperledger is um, it. <clears throat> the goal is um, in the all for all intents and purposes, this the direction is enterprise grade, modular, open source components and platforms uh, that provide um, not only infrastructure but a the platform for for applications and i think i find that exciting because i haven't seen that um collection before in the um that's applicable to erp and uh financial applications i uh, available before and and i actually 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 i'd like to go just a little bit back before uh, where Greg has put a, a stake in the ground in mentioning ERP. Um, I, I go back prior to that, actually working on MRP systems, uh, MRP systems that were independent from a general ledger. So this um, this micro ERP package I mentioned earlier started off as micro MRP, and it didn't have a general ledger. It had a... Um, an ability to output a, um, a file containing all the general ledger transactions that went that would go, quite, was quite often uploaded into an SAP system or a similar system of that type, so a headquarters type system. And um, so you could say I could see from a patent point of view that we'd shipped thousands of these um, and we never had the general ledger they were always um, they were always integrated with another system and in here I come across uh, blockchain and I can see that the um, we have a common ledger and that common ledger is um, can be distributed to all of the uh, participants inside a um, a network in terms of ethereum in the in the in the bitcoin it's sort of a big public network in time in terms of uh, hyperledger it's a business network that could be uh small probably as just you know two very large banks doing business together or it could be as large as a sap supply chain for a complex product like the iphone so um i, I find that Technology really exciting and, um, and and just look forward to you know to to building and prototyping on it. So I think there's a couple of pieces for the readers to think about in terms of enterprise adoption of of blockchain and where it might go from here. I went to a show in New York City last May, Consensus 2016 which is run by Coindesk, which is arguably the, the big blockchain show of the year. Uh, at that time, a lot of the enterprise blockchain activity and discussion centered around the Ethereum platform, uh, which has since gotten caught up in some controversy around a hard fork issue, which I wrote about on Diginomica. Uh, but it kind of illustrated a little bit of the growing pains of, of community-based uh, platforms. Um, now Hyperledger... Uh, that these guys have described, which IBM is a major contributor towards, uh, is sort of taken center stage. But one of these platforms would need to sort of emerge as, a, as I think, sort of a de facto standard or of sorts if, if we're going to get further from the enterprise perspective. Um, there's other things to overcome. When I first started looking at blockchain, I was thinking that, you know, companies might eventually you know, rip out their ERP ledgers for this. Uh, and that could still be true, but I think there's still a lot to prove around scale. There's more regulatory hurdles than, than I, than I understood in some industries. Uh, so there's a lot in terms of a maturity of blockchain technology that, that needs to happen. But with that in mind, I'm kind of curious for these guys, like what kinds of, 
of enterprise use cases do you see coming that you think are are kind of a realistic next step for for blockchain in the next year or two? I think SAP already has done some uh, testing and experiments and with the payments with uh, the company. I think it was associated with Hyperledger or Linux Foundation. Uh, I believe the, the name of the company is Ripple. I think they made uh, a payment uh, transfer, uh, I believe $1,000 from uh, somewhere in Germany to Canada. And this was a successful test. So there's definitely SAP doing something um, or publicizing an event. An event. Um, again, I'm, I'm very SAP centric. I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 80% SAP, 20% IBM, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, but, but there's others. I mean, there's Microsoft, uh, an event uh, uh, hosted by Amazon. They were on Wall Street um, talking about blockchain and getting everybody excited and what it is and how Amazon provides a solution. IBM's interest, again, they, they try to uh, be as indirect as possible. I, I spent some time with the company. I just I understand the culture. They, they have very high profile, uh, very many high profile customers and clients that they don't necessarily want uh, their names uh, mentioned any, anywhere. Um, IBM is, is also trying to do um, cloud, uh, Nomics. So um, you, you, you start with uh, Fabric, which is, which is the main um, code for, for the Hyperledger. And you end up on, on Bluemix. So it's it, they, they kind of go hand in hand together. They want as much open source to, to be developed and the contribution, the meetings are very open, uh, they're weekly. Uh, but at some point, uh, IBM will say, yes, we have a solution for our clients and now it's, it's purely uh, IT solution owned and the patents are filed and everything is blessed by uh, with the legal team, and it's no longer open source. It's the solution that IBM sells to, to its customer base. So, obviously, they're not interested in, in the repeat of uh, Ethereum issues or, or any other uh, spectacular uh, spectacular market events. Like the most recent one, I think, is Zcash. I think it started at 10 million and now it's uh, around I don't know, $10. So, it's, 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 I cannot, I cannot imagine another cryptocurrency coming out and, and saying we're using blockchain and, and it's valued, uh, it's going to lose value 99% in the first weeks uh, after flotation. That, that, that just cannot happen with something that uh, IBM would uh, like to be mentioned with. Um, so I, I think we, we, we're still going to have an event like this in 2017. It's, it, it's, it's in the shadows. And the enterprises, uh, the more they hear about it, uh, the, the further they want to stay away from it. Um, but right. also, also in the hack pass, the last meeting was with somebody from uh, Ethereum. So you, you never know. The, the, the kind of open source community wants to get as much, as many contributions as they can. I, I think it's also a recruiting ground for, for those companies. Um, they want to have as much of free developer resources working on their solution as possible. So at some at some point it, it, it becomes a proprietary code, right? And I don't, I don't, I think you're onto something here, Greg. As far as I do think that it's there's no longer a debate that that open source communities and developer, uh, you know, engagement, whatever you want to call it, is going to be a big part of how future solutions are developed, not just blockchain. And and from that angle, I think. You know, I see the relevance for enterprises right away. In terms of a specific use case, you were talking about the 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 payment test that SAP uh, successfully conducted. Uh, how how do you see that working? Would do you think that could become uh, like an add on solution that would be used for specific scenarios, or what what would be SAP's next step? Do you think? You know, I, I realize you're not working on their product team, but how do you see that being used? I think natural extension is for it to become part of S4 HANA. So it's going to be mm -hmm. HANA Ledger or, or um, Simple Finance or Finance 3.0 or whatever the next iteration is. They, they will include it uh, with, with their existing um, 
cash management solution. But that's the current um, state of affairs as far as the city is concerned. Yeah, yeah. So are you are you implying, Greg, that that they don't have like like that type of payment solution now, or that they would replace what the, what they had, or what are you thinking? No, no. Uh, SAP, along with with uh, financial institutions, is on the ISO's uh, payment standards uh, uh, committee, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, there's existing payment solutions out of SAP, just like they are out of uh, IBM and Oracle. So the, all those companies are uh, competing for, for the financial services slash treasury customer to um, to to do basic business, uh, which is which is uh, payments. Right. So you think this could essentially add something? It's not about uh, replacing the core ledger in S four Hana, but it's about adding payment functionality that it doesn't have currently. In this case, uh, I don't think SAP is interested in anybody replacing their ledger solutions. Yeah, so they, it's definitely a, a, a market they want to uh, dominate going forward. But um, hard to say. I mean, there's there's been disruption in the industry, um, so you, you never know who's going to be next. Let me put that question to to you, Clive. Just in terms mm-hmm. of. Uh, you know, enterprise adoption, because my feeling is that it's not going to be like a blockchain revolution per se. If, if blockchain takes over the enterprise in any way, I think it will be gradual. There'll be, Mm -hmm. you know, and it probably will start with finance, but there'll be use cases that emerge that are, that are clear that, that show an example of what blockchain can do. Are you starting to see a couple of those that you think are are interesting. I realize there's not a lot of products out there yet, but mm-hmm. are you mm-hmm. seeing some potentials? <clears throat> well, um, before I jumped on this call today, I thought I'd do a little research and I just went and looked uh, through the Financial Times. I searched on blockchain and up popped Walmart and not specifically Walmart in China. And <clears throat> That uh, provided a little segue here for me to talk about or speculate about where I believe we're going to see uh, a good deal of uh, blockchain adoption. It And it's in more of the mundane things. Uh, I think that um, Greg's probably right in terms of uh, SAP. and But SAP deals with a lot of awfully large companies and moves a huge amounts of cash around um, and finance. But I think there's a lot of uh, small players in the supply chain that supply much larger companies. And those larger companies have a, uh, a, ma- a managing a good deal of um, liability dealing with smaller companies. And <clears throat> so I think the, the larger env- uh, and the more mundane use cases are going to be more around the trusted environment. And the trusted environment, I would put into that umbrella things like uh, quality control and certificate of ownership and certificates of compliance. So um, Walmart, for example, has a pilot. I think it's a production pilot, not a pilot pilot going on um, where um, their pork supplier, perhaps in China, is... um, they can use, uh, they have a blockchain uh, application that is able to track lot and serial numbers or lot numbers uh, through all the uh, pork processing supply chain in China. I have a couple of friends. Uh, one is ex McKenzie, and sh- uh, she formerly worked at, um, she just left a little bit recently, um, a cho- major chocolatier that has uh, manufacturing in China. And uh, she was um, very involved with the quality, just making sure that um, China had a, a few years back there the tainted milk. And in fact, Chinese folks, people still today, still buy milk over the internet, uh, milk products, because they don't want to feed their babies um, anything which is tainted. So I think that the quality aspects in, in the trusted environment, um, the ability to uh, connect in and, and um authenticate um, quality will be um, a big use case in in the ERP space. And I think that's also quite difficult to obtain and arrange with with current technologies. Um, 
And I also believe that in um, parts of Asia that the uh, uh, sneaker or the um, sort of the running shoe market is operates in parts of Indonesia, Vietnam, China. And um, it's a sort of a similar thing there. A U.S. company operating in that environment uh, is dealing with smaller companies. And they've got to make sure those smaller companies uh, do the right thing in terms of um, processing water and so forth. They don't want to have any sort of, um, could you call it like bad reputation, um, come back and be associated with their brand name. So they want to have a good quality operation. And so they want to monitor that supply chain. And so they want to authenticate. I think another use case may be a much larger company. Um, Alibaba is a sort of the Chinese version of, of, of Amazon. And <clears throat> they are... Um, I was recently, I was actually recently at a sort of a, I don't know what you call it, a job interview or sort of a, um, that type of an event where they had a, a large number of people and their directors were talking about um, their capabilities and their, and their goals. And they, they aim to be shipping something like, I think it's like, it's, it's ridiculously large, like 3 billion packages per day by 2025. It's a huge number. And so the way to the way a lot of those packages are going to go through, they have a um, a supply chain arm. I think it's called Calico, and that supply chain arm needs to um, authenticate that um, some of those products, if they're built, bought, purchased through Alibaba, are are genuine products. For example, actually, I think the U.S. Um, U.S. government put uh, Alibaba back into the penalty box today for shipping uh, counterfeit goods. So I think that uh, certificates of, of um, ownership, uh, authenticity, and compliance will be use cases that um, the big companies need that tie in small companies. So I think we'll see some um, applications, more mundane applications, not as that don't have all the hype associated with them um, in terms of uh, big banks. Uh, I think we'll see those in the enterprise space. I totally agree with that. I think in, (laughs) and what I would say is that in the enterprise mundane is sexy, Um, you know, solving, (laughs) solving these mundanities gains a lot of momentum for technology solutions. I don't know if you guys picked up on this from, from last year, but, to Clive, Clive's point, Delaware has initiated some blockchain initiatives around record keeping for private companies. Delaware is kind of a big deal in the U.S. because most it's the most popular state for incorporation for companies. And essentially, it's, it has to do with blockchain's smart contract features, which essentially sort of automate a lot of processes and make transparent the process of contractors contracts. And so, for example, like to Clive's point around authenticity uh, gets very complicated with private companies when you have various shareholder agreements that supersede one another. And so the state of Delaware has a, a pilot program they're, they're working on that involves moving state archival records to an open distributed ledger. Um, so anyway, it's just an interesting example because you have to Clive's point, you have a million smaller companies incorporated in Delaware that are potentially impacted that you know that could use this technology. Some of them are very big, but a lot of them are smaller companies. So the, these are the kinds of projects that I find interesting because while they're still pilot projects, they point to the potential to start having you know public examples of of how blockchain can work. I just I just want to make one slight comment to um, mundaneness of, of payments. Uh, there's so much reconciliation effort spent on making ledgers show what they're supposed to show and then proving what they show they have shown that, that that's what they were sort of keeping care for uh, for the investing public for the Wall Street for the SECs and, and host other uh, government agencies um, just just making sure that the, the numbers that are shown are what they represent 
and, and I've seen some promises that blockchain is going to replace that uh, and it's going to disrupt that core financial task and, and the armies of people performing it on a daily basis. And to me, that it's very mundane, but it's irreplaceable. There will be people doing reconciliations on the blockchain, even though you have um, that's a proven um, chain of ownership. There will be issues with implementations, with working, with um, versioning, your typical software maintenance. I just don't see it go away. So just because it's, it's payments, uh, I think it even requires more work. And it will, whoever wins the race, and there will be more than one player, um, will, will kind of be a new ERP or DLT kid on the block. Yeah, definitely. I think the the interesting thing we should point out is there are a lot of skeptics. Uh, Steve Wilson over at Constellation Research is one of the prominent ones. He doesn't he doesn't think you can move blockchain outside of its cryptocurrency foundation where it thrives without sort of undoing the security architecture. And so there's still a lot of like resistance. Now, granted, you can get a lot of page views too by by writing inflammatory posts dismissing new technologies. <laughs> it's sort of the, never do that, right? Yeah, it, it's sort of the counter to to hyping hyping them. But I do think you know there there are a lot of critics who claim that the blockchain is simply a slow a slow database that is designed for decentralized. And once you apply more permissions, credentials, and things like that, um, then you've essentially defeated the purpose. So it's going to be interesting to see how those critics respond when more of these projects are 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 happening. Because I think, like to Clyde's point, when you have people like companies like Walmart and Alibaba investing in this, it, it kind of shows you that the truth, as always, probably lies somewhere in the middle, right? It, <laughs> Yes, yeah, and and, and actually, um, <clears throat> John, I should um, I should just make a correction there or self correction, and that was that was me. That was Walmart is does have a, a blockchain, but Alibaba was more me um, yeah, speculating yeah. or imagining that that's going to be a very useful tool for them and to get right. them, let them get that scale. I'm um, just following up there on, on what Greg was mentioning. Um, uh, while we were at the Hyperledger conference, one of the um, one of the one of the very interesting talks was from Richard uh, Brown of uh, R3, the CTO, of, and uh, the Corda the Corda um, software, uh, the R3's uh, flagship, had recently been um, open sourced, and uh, they joined the um, Hyperledger Foundation as the sort of a a, th a third product um, a pr a project underneath the umbrella and he spent a good time of actually uh, talking along the lines of the Greg was just about the um, the amount of effort that goes into reconciliation of uh, financial transactions um, and this was underscored by um, a conversation that went on after Richard had finished speaking about um, that came up a number of times about what happens in uh a, uh, an enterprise database when you have a, a, a transaction that um, you want to reverse out of the system. Uh, so I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical system, even though there's double entry bootkeeping, some systems actually allow you to delete a transaction. And one of the things about Hyperledger and about uh, blockchain, actually blockchain technologies is um, they are... Um, Generally, they are immutable. In other words, that means that if you want to um, delete a transaction, you don't. What you actually do is you actually put a replacement transaction in that um, that um, that that um, it it. In, I'm, I'm almost contradicting myself over here. It basically uh, it, it basically mutates or or changes that transaction. So in so um, the, the, I think what I'm trying to say is that imagine this scenario. This is the one I, I brought up at the conference. It was some folks were saying, "Okay, well let's 
we have this particular case. I think it was the right to be forgotten. It's a big, big issue in the in Europe that U.S. software vendors need to cater to. Yep. And so, how do you deal with that with the blockchain if if you can't do do deletions? Well, so um, one way to to deal with it is to is to um, use uh, privacy and 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 and. and um, and so that, that that data remains in the database, but is no longer viewable. Um, so it's 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 there, but it's actually it's actually it's actually gone. And I, I call this the delete the delete. In other words, um, sometimes in a in a imagine you know sort of like the the few years back the Lehman Brothers case where we had um, um, a big a big mess in 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 finance that almost crashed the world economies. Um, if, if people had been able to delete transactions, um, they wouldn't be able to reconstruct, you know, who owns what and, and, and how, to, how to put that, the whole chain back together again. So I think that um, blockchain could be very, very useful there because it provides this, this, this traceability. But at the same time, there's, um, there's, there's, there's engineered solutions around that to deal with things like uh, right to be forgotten so that if all of a sudden law enforcement comes along and says, well, this whatever was deleted needs to be um, delete the delete so that we can reestablish what the what the chain of custody is in, in, in the database. So we can see that, that <clears throat> Lehman Brothers promised something and, and somebody else is... is um, is 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 due to be uh, compensated for that uh, for that for that promise. So, uh, went off track there a little bit, but I'm just trying to give some flavour for uh, how strong uh, blockchain could be in, in in finance. Right, because to your point, they you couldn't hide the transaction trail behind it, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. So it's it, it it's sort of an enforced transparency. Yes. Yep. And and that's that's the idea is that sort of bad actors, so to speak, it would be impossible to, to do it because you would not be able to, to hide anything. Mm-hmm. I, I sometimes call it enforced trust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now imagine that over in the in the um, in the ERP space to deal with the quality control. We've got this new um, federal requirements that folks are dealing with the Food Safety Management Act, where we need to have uh, traceability. And uh, generally, I think we need to have electronic traceability. Right. So um, so here we have a, a technology and here we have some regulatory requirements. So let's put the two together and see what um, see if we can't uh, sell some software. Indeed. So, guys, we should – wrap up pretty soon i I'd, I'd love to just chat for another couple hours yeah we, we could do like the rest of the day but yeah yeah but I, I do just before we wrap up i just i just want to make sure the listeners hear a little bit more stories on the ground about your experience at the the Hy- hyperledger event do you want to share any other high points you had either hands-on hacking or or big ideas anything else that came out of that for you uh yes so um I think I attended about three or four different events in 2016. One of them was um, one hosted by, I think it was some kind of blockchain event hosted by MIT Media Lab. And, and I saw a, a lot of people again at the Hackfest. So there is definitely uh, a lot of attention. Um, every participant in those events uh, has a, a little bit different agenda. Um, if there were banks in, at MIT, they didn't make themselves known as banks. Uh, there were people flying from, uh, I don't know, Australia, Japan, definitely a, a global global uh, event. Um, in New York, uh, I also um, attended an uh, initiative that uh, IBM is promoting uh, through their Bluemix, which, which is kind of answer to Amazon's cloud success. Uh, so there were people... Uh, from IBM or associated with IBM, trying to uh, recruit um, for IBM's, um, I, I saw it as a recruitment, but maybe it wasn't was officially a recruitment event, but trying to get um, uh, developers 
interested and engage in any uh, blockchain open source or at some point not so open source uh, initiatives. So yes, um, this was definitely a, a blockchain year for me. Uh, they were all sponsored events. Um, the big names were there, uh, even if they were, didn't announce themselves. Uh, there was a lot of attention. And um, hopefully in 2017, that there won't be another Ethereum. Um, and that this will progress to more boring behind the scenes uh, support type of uh, um, support type of um, work that, that we're familiar with from the inner field. Home. I, what I, I think is a, a little bit of a highlight that ties something up, a loose end up, is that I believe there's now potentially five different um, projects underneath the uh, underneath the Hyperledger Linux Foundation umbrella. And <clears throat> so there is the uh, Fabric that I believe is um, IBM contributed. There's the Sawtooth that I believe Intel contributed. Um, at the at the uh, in New York there another company uh, founders and uh, another project joined I think it's uh, IROA which is a mobile first um, distributed ledger technology from uh, Japan and um, they seem to have more use cases in this mobile first less business more more consumer app uh, identity applications the um, there was Corda from R3, which is sort of London and New York, in big strength in the financial. Um, and there was also, as uh, Greg mentioned, I believe um, Ethereum join is, is potentially going to join. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. Uh, they were there, and I believe there was some side side discussions about about Ethereum coming underneath the uh, Ipoledia, um umbrella. So, but actually all of those five projects have a slightly different proof of elapsed time. So you mentioned earlier on in the podcast here uh, about an issue in terms of scalability, you know, is, is 10 minutes too long to wait for a transaction? I think if anybody um, was buying an, an Oracle database, they wouldn't want to spend 10 minutes waiting for a transaction. They would expect that transaction to be lickety splittity and, um, and that would be considered completely ridiculous. But, um, but I think there's another aspect of this and that is that when a database becomes very, very distributed, you, um, you end up with a situation. You can actually see this if you go onto Facebook and you post something on your wall and somebody else posts something on the wall. Quite often, if you look at the two views in um, on two different computers, you can actually see different different views. And that is because the um, the update into Facebook has not populated across all the network. It's it is a collection of distributed databases, and that is a sort of an eventual consistency. An eventual consistency works fine uh, in a Facebook type application because it's not dealing with money. But I think that when uh, business networks become very, very large, um, and it we you know let's imagine there's an SAP uh, parent company that has lots and lots of small satellites that are either its own or or, or, ve- or vendors, and uh, there's a transaction that needs to move through the system. Ten minutes is probably fine because uh, it wouldn't move there any faster on EDI or any other type of technology. So uh, the fact that we've now got five different projects, and you, you mentioned uh, earlier, John, that probably one of these or will be like somehow become very strong in the enterprise space. And I think that's that would probably happen there, but we've got these five different proofs of elapsed time, which... Um, Sort of, it's maybe it's a little bit of a horse race there to see which one is going to be the best solution. So I think that's very healthy, and, and there's sort of another aspect of open source. Uh, definitely agree with that. It will be an interesting year for for the blockchain for sure. I sh- we should probably make a point to listeners that because it's an open source project, you can check it out and potentially start getting involved. 
Uh, this is not a, a passive thing for you. You can do what someone like Greg did, who's a SAP financials guy who dove in. Are you guys going to uh, maintain involvement between events? Do you have little things you're tinkering with? Uh, this is quite for you. I, I certainly do. Um, going to tinker around and maybe um, I already made some connections uh, at the Hyperledger um, Hackfest in New York City with um, with a Chinese company that's quite interested in um, having me do some work uh, for them, be their legs in the U.S. Um, apparently, one of the next, I think the next conference in in uh, quarterly conference is going to be in Hong Kong or, or Shenzhen, China. So, um, and there's uh, something like 80 companies in China that are uh, already uh, interested in and have signed up to either with the Hyperledger Foundation or, or signed up to attend the conference in the, I think, in the March time frame next year. What about you, Greg? Are you, do you have some sandboxes of your own? Uh, right. So I, I'm definitely uh, uh, kind of tagging along with, with SAP. SAP wants to do open source as well. Um, the, the latest uh, edition of HANA goes out to GitHub. You can, you can go in and, and source your own code and then do version control and use all those uh, wonderful uh, tools that Hyperledger is using to, to a much larger extent. Um, I, I, I don't see uh, why, why uh, SAP, Oracle, IBM, um, IBM even with their own branded products uh, should go and, and kind of use anybody's help. You, I think you can contribute to Bitcoin if you want to. You can, you can uh, uh, put your code out and say, yes, uh, I think there's a deficiency here and uh, let the, the keepers of the code uh, approve it or probably reject it. Uh, but yeah, you, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of watching that space um, quite often. Greg, have you always been a, a technical guy uh, because I know you do a lot of functional work. Right. I'm, I'm definitely, um, I, 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 I've been called recently technical, um, functional, yeah. so, um, or functionally technical. technical. Um, I just don't see the, the, the difference between finance IT and IT finance. There's no difference to me. Well, I think that's where the professional skill set should be headed. So hopefully that will benefit you in your career path. Guys, I think we should wrap it. It's been a it's been an interesting talk. I look forward to hearing of your progress. I'm sure you're going to let me hear all about it in in blog comments going forward. So I look forward to that also. Thanks, John, for hosting. Thanks for hosting this, John. Look forward to um, seeing the post. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. All right, thanks a lot.